It's important to preserve the monitor for a variety of reasons. One is it's a piece of our American fabric, the story of what happened to our country 150 years ago today. And in a way, this one little ironclad was representative of a greater struggle. And so by stabilizing this ship, we're helping to tell the story of preserving the Union, keeping it together, and really kind of restarting the country so it was. Part of what we have to do in the Conservation Department is really assess artifacts individually. That's really one of the most important things we can do. So once an artifact's recovered from the ocean, before we can even touch it, we have to photo document it, x-ray it, do some written descriptions, and really assess what we're dealing with. It could be something simple or complex, but we really have to know what the material is and what we're setting out to do. Documentation, in a way, it's both complex and simple. What we're dealing with is um, a specific format of how we record our information. And what we're trying to do is document every single thing that we do to the artifact. We're trying to leave a record for our colleagues here at the lab, for researchers who come into the library. Basically, anything we do that impacts or changes that artifact, whether it's removing sediment or measuring the amount of chlorides in the treatment solution, that's information that gets documented. Um, archaeology in its own right is destructive, and so archaeological conservation in a way, you know, if this mass came up from the ocean covered in a hard sediment and we x-ray it and know there's an artifact under that, well, we are modifying that to get to the artifacts. We have to document all of that. Additionally, if you're, say, taking apart a steam engine, it goes from one single object to thousands of individual components. And if we're treating them in different sections of the lab with different methods, we need to know how to track these individual pieces where they are in their treatment process and ultimately get them back together reassembled in the appropriate order. So we have multiple databases, uh, paper documentation, um, computer programs set up to do a lot of this work. It's a giant evolving thing. Believe it or not, this project here, we have 210 tons of artifacts. We have a staff member solely devoted to the documentation process. And that's really important when we're tracking over 1,500 different artifacts, which may break down into 10, 15, 20,000 individual components. I am the conservation technician for the USS Monitor Project. Uh, basically, my job is to number and document where objects come from. The first thing I do is give it a number. That's going to be a particular number that coincides with the year that the object came up, the batch that it came up in, and the number of wherever it came from. Second thing I do is document where exactly objects came from. So basically, at the end of this project, when everything gets put back together, it's going to be my job to make sure that people know which bolt came out of which hole and which nut went on that bolt. Everything is completely documented, say, a copper alloy screw. We have probably 50 copper alloy screws off of the cannon carriage. Now, each one of those screws is measured it's gone over and documented as far as, is there a flat part here? Is there a deterioration? Uh, is it bent? We also document exactly which hole it came from. Then it gets photographed. Then a number is placed on it and it is put in a vial, then placed in its storage until a later date when it can actually start the conservation and treatment process. Concretion is that hard matrix of sand and shell and calcium that forms over a lot of artifacts when they're beneath the ocean. So the artifacts recovered from Monitor National Marine Sanctuary were heavily concreted. The Worthington Pump's a great example. We even found some masses of concreted sediment that likely contained artifacts, in which case we x-rayed them to look inside. But that concretion, although it helps at a certain point to cover an artifact and protect it in some ways, very difficult to remove. And if we're talking about fragile cast iron or organic materials where there's concretion, we use different methods and materials to do that. So the treatment phase for most monitor objects begins with the removal of bulk concreted products. This includes mixtures of sediment, corrosion, and dead marine life. 
To do this, we actually start out with a mixture of mechanical and pneumatic tools. So that's basically starting out with hammers and chisels, and then from there, moving to the use of pneumatic tools, which includes large air hammers, mid-sized air scribes, ending off with really teeny, fine um, pneumatic air chisels. And so you can start out with heavy-handed tools, but as we move the large material, then you have to go to finer and finer and finer tools, even down to scalpels and tweezers and brushes at the end. What you're looking at now is actually mixtures of wrought iron objects and wood. And so part of the treatment process involves separating out the iron components from the wood components. We kind of have an idea of what's actually there through use of x-radiography. We can actually see, in some cases, the wood structure as well as the iron structure side by side. X-ray is a really neat technique that we use. Not, not all the time, but it really depends on the artifact. We realized that the archaeologists had recovered the remains of one of the ship's bilge pumps. We could tell by some of the external shape that there was a lot of sediment, hard concreted shell and sediment on the exterior of the object. And without really getting a better look inside, we, we weren't sure of the overall condition or health of that artifact. So we actually took multiple x-rays of the object, mosaic them together, and that provided us basically with an internal view of the entire artifact. We could see the original spring valves, the poppets, the drive shafts, the steam chest, all the little cylinders. We, we could see the entire workings of the artifact in a series of x-rays, and that was without even laying our hands on it. We're doing what's called marine archaeological conservation. And so, just like with terrestrial archaeology, when you see people digging in the desert, we want to record everything. And so it's a very slow, methodical process to capture all that information. So to some people, this heavy, concreted lump means nothing, but to us, it's got a whole story. And part of our goal, through even just cleaning with mechanical tools, is try to capture every aspect of that story and be able to save it for the public at some point down the line. Salt removal is probably one of the biggest battles that we face with artifacts recovered from a marine environment. The soluble salts in seawater will actually go inside of artifacts. We're talking about inside of iron, so we'll have salt actually that has penetrated the original surface of the artifact. If we were just to leave that in there, dry these artifacts out on the surface, that salt's eventually going to crystallize, and it's going to put a lot of internal pressure on this weak, graphitized iron, and essentially can cause damage to the point where they fall apart. If we don't remove these salts, they'll continue to corrode internally, the pressures will break things. Um, it's a big issue. So what we have to do is actually extract those chlorides. Inside the lab, we have a few different methods to analyze the amount of chlorides within an artifact or within a treatment solution. Currently, we're using ion chromatography, and basically we're able to test in parts per million how many chlorides are in any given solution. So that's our kind of standard method right now. And when we are performing a treatment, we're trying to get less than one part per million chloride in that solution. So extremely, extremely pure. The water that we use in order to make sure that we have good desalination is considerably more pure than tap water. We're producing deionized and reverse osmosis water that has less than one part per million. That way we can be certain that the salts that we find in the solution are coming from the artifact. To better explain desalination, essentially what we'll do is we'll take an artifact after it's been mechanically cleaned and place it in our treatment solution. If you take something from a very salty environment and place it in a very wet freshwater environment, those salts are naturally going to want to migrate out of the artifact into that fresh solution to reach an equilibrium. And believe it or not, in a very short period of time, even a few days, some of those levels of salts will spike up to many thousands of parts per million of salts. I mean, extremely high salinity levels. Once we have chlorides that aren't really getting any higher in that solution, that the level of those aren't increasing, we'll dispose of that solution and place the artifact back into a very fresh solution. So over time, you generate a series of arcs, basically curves, showing you that level of salt. And as you continue to extract salt, less and less is released over time. Change your solution, extract salt, change your solution. And basically, you'll get to a point over time where no more salts are being released. And typically, we're able to get that down to less than one part per million. Some small artifacts, like rubber buttons, can be desalinated in a week or more, a very short amount of time. Um, something like the cannons, which we have, the two 11-inch Dahlgren guns from the monitor, they're 13 feet long, they weigh eight tons. They're in their 10th year of desalination, and they're still releasing chlorides. So without you know, knowing a specific equation to track that, which doesn't exist, we're just 
continuously testing those solutions over time. So anywhere from a few days or weeks to decades. We can speed up the desalination process. Electrolytic reduction is, is a technique that we use in which we run an electrical current directly into the artifact. It sounds like a complex process, but it really isn't. By running a negative electrical current into the artifact, we're able to force out the negatively charged salt ions. And so basically that like charge is forcing the salt out. At the same time, electrolysis uses a series of anodes. Those have a positive charge and they help to attract out the salts. So essentially we are increasing the rate of desalination within our specific treatment solution and that really helps to effectively remove those chlorides. Once we're confident that the salts are out, we've tested the solutions in the artifacts, then we want to remove any chemicals that have built up in the artifact. The solutions that we use for salt extraction have a high pH for iron artifacts, about pH 12 or 13. Some of the residual chemical will remain inside of the artifact. So we place that in a very, very fresh reverse osmosis bath, and that rinses out any residual chemical. Once the chemical's out, we can safely begin drying the artifacts. Drying differs uh, from artifact to artifact. Something like a wooden gun tool, we actually place that in a freeze dryer, and we're using that to help remove final moisture from the artifact. That can take a few days to a, a few months or more. Um, something like uh, an iron artifact, let's say the Worthington pump components, we're actually drying those, not just by placing them out in ambient air, but we're actually placing them, we're constructing a small dehumidification chamber. So what we're gonna do is actually lower the humidity inside of that chamber by increments of say five or 10% relative humidity over time. And therefore we're not shocking the artifact by placing it, taking it from a wet environment and placing it in something that's very dry. That could have actual physical effects to the artifact. So slowly dialing back the humidity and drying the artifact over time is a big, a big thing. The gallery itself is an evolving thing here at the Mariner's Museum. During mid-treatment, we're thinking, all right, is there a way that we can display this differently now that we're seeing things differently as a result of treatment? So it's kind of an organic, evolving exhibit out there in the galleries. While the treatment itself is very specific, the way that they're presented to the public, the way that these things are put on display, if they're visible, if they're touchable, you know, we can have a really dynamic display, we can have a static display, we can have all of these things in the same gallery to provide a different experience. But a key component of that is what is the most stable environment long-term for an artifact. We keep the gallery at a certain temperature and humidity, which is good for a general mixed collection. But something that's, uh, let's say, a composite of cast iron and rubber and different materials, we may want to put that in a specific smaller case, like a microclimate, where we can control that differently from the main gallery. That really just depends on what is best suited for that artifact or size of artifact. There are so many amazing pieces that have been recovered from the wreck of the monitor. But sometimes the most impressive ones aren't the biggest ones. I think my favorite is probably the Phoenix glass, the resurgum glass as we call it. Um, it's a glass or shards of glass that were recovered from the interior of the turret. And uh, when they were put back together, the conservators could make out the head of a bird and a word, and the word was Latin. So we all got out our Latin dictionaries and found out that resurgum means I shall rise again. And the bird was actually a phoenix rising from the ashes. And that kind of gave us all cold shivers because the turret did in fact rise again. hoping to have all these artifacts treated within 20 to 25 years. And it's hard to really pin down an exact time because what we're doing here, you can't just punch in numbers into a simple equation. It's really a matter of, of listening to the artifacts and understanding the chemical processes that are happening. Somebody might say, why the heck should we do this? Why is it important? People don't question putting money or time and effort into stabilizing the Statue of Liberty or the Washington Monument. I mean, this is something that helped to preserve the entire country in one of the most dynamic times of war. This is one of the most significant vessels of all time, and we have the opportunity to do something with it, to teach people about it, and we're absolutely doing that.
Concretion is that hard matrix of sand and shell and calcium that forms over a lot of artifacts when they're beneath the ocean. So the artifacts recovered from Monitor National Marine Sanctuary were heavily concreted. The Worthington Pump's a great example. We even found some masses of concreted sediment that likely contained artifacts, in which case we x-rayed them to look inside. But that concretion, although it helps at a certain point to cover an artifact and protect it in some ways, very difficult to remove. And if we're talking about fragile cast iron or organic materials where there's concretion, we use different methods and materials to do that. So the treatment phase for most monitor objects begins with the removal of bulk concreted products. This includes mixtures of sediment, corrosion, and dead marine life. To do this, we actually start out with a mixture of mechanical and pneumatic tools. So that's basically starting out with hammers and chisels, and then from there, moving to the use of pneumatic tools, which includes large air hammers, mid-sized air scribes, ending off with really teeny, fine um, pneumatic air chisels. And so you can start out with heavy-handed tools, but as you remove the large material, then you have to- We are modifying that to get to the artifacts. We have to document all of that. Additionally, if you're, say, taking apart a steam engine, it goes from one single object to thousands of individual components. And if we're treating them in different sections of the lab with different methods, we need to know how to track these individual pieces where they are in their treatment process and ultimately get them back together reassembled in the appropriate order. So we have multiple databases, uh, paper documentation, um, computer programs set up to do a lot of this work. It's a giant evolving thing. Believe it or not, this project here, we have 210 tons of artifacts. We have a staff member solely devoted to the documentation process. And that's really important when we're tracking over 1,500 different artifacts, which may break down into 10, 15, 20,000 individual components. I am the conservation technician for the USS Monitor Project. Uh, basically, my job is to number and document where objects come from. The first thing I do is give it a number. That's going to be a particular number that coincides with the year that the object came up. It's important to preserve the monitor for a variety of reasons. One is it's a piece of our American fabric, the story of what happened to our country 150 years ago today. And in a way, this one little ironclad was representative of a greater struggle. And so by stabilizing this ship, we're helping to tell the story of preserving the Union, keeping it together, and really kind of restarting the country so it was. Part of what we have to do in the conservation department is really assess the batch that it came up in, and the number of wherever it came from. Second thing I do is document where exactly objects came from. So basically, at the end of this project, when everything gets put back together, it's going to be my job to make sure that people know which bolt came out of which hole and which nut went on that bolt. Everything is completely documented, say, a copper alloy screw. We have probably 50 copper alloy screws off of the cannon carriage. Now, each one of those screws is measured. It's gone over and documented as far as, is there a flat part here? Is there a deterioration? Uh, is it bent? We also document exactly which hole it came from. Then it gets photographed. Then a number is placed on it, and it is put in a vial, then placed in its storage until a later date when it can actually start the conservation and treatment process. artifacts individually. That's really one of the most important things we can do. So once an artifact's recovered from the ocean, before we can even touch it, we have to photo document it, 
x-ray it, do some written descriptions, and really assess what we're dealing with. It could be something simple or complex, but we really have to know what the material is and what we're setting out to do. Documentation, in a way, it's both complex and simple. What we're dealing with is um, a specific format of how we record our information. And what we're trying to do is document every single thing that we do to the artifact. We're trying to leave a record for our colleagues here at the lab, for researchers who come into the library. Basically, anything we do that impacts or changes that artifact, whether it's removing sediment or measuring the amount of chlorides in the treatment solution, that's information that gets documented. Um, archaeology in its own right is destructive, and so archaeological conservation in a way, you know, if this mass came up from the ocean covered in a hard sediment and we x-ray it, no, there's an artifact under that. Well, we